Yeah, we're live. Hi there. So this is Jason Memel with uh, uh, Talknosis, and uh, we're here for kind of an episode zero of an idea that we've been working on of like pop culture examinations of uh, Gnosticism uh, with things that may or may not themselves be Gnostic uh, or are intending to be Gnostic, but we're choosing to try to see what we can tease out there anyway. Um, so uh, special thanks to Jonathan for uh, letting me letting me try out this idea. And uh, this is kind of an episode zero. I'll have a co-host here soon called uh, Rebecca Skolnick, who you might remember from previous panels and interviews and uh, with her own uh, Gnostic shows and th things. Um, so more information there. So uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy what we're going to be getting into today. Today we're going to be talking about Darren, Aronofsky, Darren Aronofsky's film Mother, which came out in 2017. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe uh, maybe I'll bring in the other two people I've got here today, Jonathan and Angie. Um, hey guys. Hey Jason, real pleasure to be here. It's been a treat of mine for a long time, you know, to be yeah. on this this excellent program. So uh, yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> um, uh, should we take care of some of the, the the boilerplate business before we get going? Yeah, yeah, because you know, starting a new show, having more shows per month, that's more time, that's more resources, isn't it, Jason? It is. And, yeah, <laughs> and uh, you can help us out. You can help keep the show going. We can't uh, do both this and talk gnosis, and hopefully more shows in the future we always want to add more content but i'll tell you what we never charge for more than four to six pieces of content per month even if we do extra so you can sign up for as little as a dollar per piece of media at uh, per month at patreon.com slash gnostic you can also put a cap on that so if you just want to give us a buck give us a buck you can do it just give us a buck and then cancel the month after there you go but if that's too complicated there is one time donations over at paypal.me slash gnostic and we understand if you're unable to help us out financially i listen to lots of podcast where i do give money and i listen to lots of podcasts where i'm like i'd really like to give uh, this podcast my money but i don't have any more left so uh you can also help us by telling people about the show uh liking subscribing posting it on your social media taking an episode and sending the link to a friend and saying hey check this out i think you'd dig it okay and, uh, jason the commercial's well, over uh, yeah not and not just that but also just talking about the the show because like yeah. part of i think what all gnostics love to do is talk and think about the, the, the subject that we're interested in which is kind of what we're doing here today. So um, if uh, like join us on on like in the comments on YouTube or on uh, Reddit or any of the places where you might be hearing about the show, just start posting about it and having conversations and, and we'll do our best to join you there too. Yeah, exactly. Okay, very cool. Uh, Jason, take it away. Take it away. Okay, well, so this uh, this 2017 movie, A Mother, has uh, Jennifer Lawrence and uh, Javier Bardem as the, as the two sort of main characters. Uh, they live in a house together. Um, uh, she's rebuilding the house. She's, she's kind of uh, maintaining it. Apparently there's been a fire recently. Um, and, uh, they're living together. He's a poet, he's a creator. Uh, and then as they're kind of having this sort of idyllic life, uh, that one that does seem a little passionless, uh, all of a sudden people arrive, uh, this man shows up, uh, he's kind of got this bad cough, but he's also a big fan of the writer. Um, uh, then his wife shows up. Uh, then their kids show up and start fighting over the the son or the the the, the man's um, uh, estate, and uh, one of the brothers dies. Um, the they the, there's a big funeral. Everybody's really upset, and then the the, the uh, Jennifer Lawrence, the the the, the mother of the of the movie. Uh, gets really upset. She's like, uh, "You don't like you want to spend all this time with everybody else. You don't want to spend time with me. We we haven't even had kids." And then that they fight, but then that fight, like in so many Hollywood movies, turns into sex. Uh, that sex turns into a baby. That baby really reinvigorates their relationship and also his writing. Um, that writing becomes incredibly popular, and uh, he gets fans. And then those fans turn into zealots, and then those zealots kind of start to invade the house. And then the house becomes a battleground between like between police forces and the fans and then uh finally everything just kind of goes goes to a, a complete uh, apocalyptic head the woman is just feels like uh, uh oh that the baby that they had has been like killed by those fans in their zealotry um and so in her in her utter rage she destroys the entire house killing pretty much everybody in it and then uh, uh somehow the poet comes back um, and she is still somehow alive, uh, and he lets her know that um, he has always been around to create things, and she has always been around to make a home. And then uh, he <laughs> takes out her heart um, as the last bit of love that she had, and then uh, turns it into a crystal, which reboots everything and 
things start over with a new woman in the same place that Jennifer Lawrence was at the beginning of the movie. That's a very spoilerific, but overview of the of the movie we'll be talking about. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And uh, I'm going to start right off it because I, I think uh, you can't one to one uh, to specific Gnostic myths. But, you know, I would argue, I will argue as we talk that it, there's some deliberate Gnosticism in there, at least deliberate uh, uh, Kabbalistic thought. Uh, Aronofsky, the director, is is interested in Kabbalah. He has a movie called Pi, which is just which you should be subtitled Kabbalah will ruin your life. Um, <laughs> as I as I like to as I put in the notes, did you enjoy Thunder Perfect Mind, the movie? But mm -hmm. before <laughs> Before I ask uh, uh, the question, if you folks do uh, agree or if you do see Gnostic interpretations or how there could be Gnostic interpretations, uh, uh, our good friend uh, Clark uh, Aikens wanted to be here with us today but couldn't. But he's seen the movie. He likes it quite a bit. And the way that he put it is it's uh, the movie is Sophia from the – or sorry, the, the, the movie is the Bible from the point of view of Sophia or the, the Bible from the point of view of, of the Shekinah. And, and I thought that uh, that was quite excellent and quite mm. uh, spot on. Um, but it's, as you might have picked up with the, you know, it's a man and a, we're going to get into it, folks, and obviously lots of spoilers. We're assuming that you've seen the movie. The, the biblical parallels are not exactly subtle. Uh, they, <laughs> they, they get less subtle as the movie goes on as well. So it doesn't, yeah. you know, you can get, you can get from what, maybe the first, uh, until the brothers show up without being like, yeah, this is, he's, he's doing some of the Bible here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I, but, okay, I but I, Oh, Sorry, the, the one quick thing I do want to say is that the the brothers show up and you're like, okay, that's kind of biblical, but then when like when the the police forces show up and the baby arrives, then you're like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like what felt like maybe an, uh, a nice subtle metaphor was now like an overt uh, statement, you know. Yeah, exactly. And I, I also put in the notes, it's, as soon as she gets pregnant, like, you know, things aren't going to go well for that baby. Like, you know exactly, exactly <laughs> what's going to happen. So the question is, do you uh, the, the, do you have Gnostic interpretations of the movie or uh, uh, what have you, or at least some interesting religious interpretations of, of the movie? And, oh, I should say as well that this is also uh, uh, our Halloween special for this year as well. So it mm. is it is classed as a, as a horror movie. Wikipedia claims that it's a horror movie. I, I believe it was kind of advertised as a, as a horror movie. So. Oh, completely. Yeah. yeah, I remember I watched the trailer and I was like, uh, the, the movie the trailer prepares you for and then this movie are not the same movie. Yeah, <laughs> but you, you can argue that, that it's a thriller. and It definitely uses horror movie tropes. It's it's shot like a horror movie. It, it is like Ooh. a haunted house uh, a thriller for, you know, the, the first, half, first half hour. But oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Lay, on, lay on your Gnostic interpretations, Jason. Well, I, I think actually, like, so... Uh, one thing I kind of prefaced this this uh, episode with was saying that like uh, making Gnostic connections on things that may or may not have had Gnostic intentions, and I I feel like the movie the movie isn't trying to be Gnostic in the sense that it's not it's not presenting this as a possible uh, like um, a useful interpretation. Like I think like a lot of the stuff that I've been reading about it is that uh, Aronofsky's also an atheist, and this is kind of more of a like critical of the myth it's a sort of myth critical i would say um and uh but it, but the myth that it's being critical of is a little is a lot more quote unquote straight biblical if that makes sense mm -hmm. um uh so a lot of the gnosticism that i found in it felt like it was uh like discoveries like little little bits of treasure that a gnostic can pull out of what is inherently meant to be more just specifically critical, if that makes sense. Um, uh, like, for example, like the the character of the mother as this, uh, as a, some, well, as like kind of a uh, mother nature getting kind of like sort of going literally scorched earth kind of thing. There is also a, a, a feeling of like, yeah, if she is the Sophia, then there's kind of this example of like, having to live in the world to experience uh, to 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 find uh, a thing i don't know if that quite makes sense but like a, lo a lot of the movie she's trying to keep things stasis like she's kind of putting away anything that might be slightly corrupt but then but then through uh, a sense of hostility that's where a baby does come from and love does come from that and so there's a sense of like you know you need to be in the world to experience the light if that makes sense um yeah. That was kind of a like a, a feeling that I was having, like that it was 
Uh, I don't want to suggest that the violence that happens is necessary, but there's a sense that you can't hide from from life and death, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. And uh, I, I, I think that's that that's exactly it. And he says something, you know, to her. It's like, you know, uh, she says, uh, you know, I, I've I've created paradise here for us. But he he's, he says, you know, it's flash. You know, there's no there's no whatever. Mind you, what's it is kind of shown as paradisical, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then when the people come and when they interrupt and ruin everything, it, it is it does really seem like a like a ruin. Like they're not bringing in a lot of. Uh, uh, they're bringing in a lot of excitement, but they never seem to be bringing it anything good in. And perhaps, perhaps that that's some of the the more critical stuff. But of course, maybe mm -hmm. that is maybe that is life. Um, and uh, perhaps uh, 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 that paradise that we see at the beginning is 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 a false one. It kind of is, as we discover. But uh, or, uh, Deacon, it's not false, like hollow or hollow. Uh, yeah, empty. Um, and, and I think they get, you know, there's in Christian mysticism and in, in, in sometimes more depressing interpretations of Christian mysticism, you know, you do have this idea and, and you do find it in, in Gnosticism. You, you find it in Secret John. I see it there and in other schools that that, uh, that God is love. Therefore, uh, uh, God has to love and be loved. Right. And it kind of sounds kind of selfish. So the God has no choice but to create and have something separate from itself because that's because it's love and it needs something to love and it needs uh, as this movie quite illustrates quite well it needs to be loved <laughs> um well and actually angie just before we started had a had a thought on that that i'd love to to bring back in now yeah i um i didn't read the story as much unfortunately clark isn't here to fight me on this but uh, yeah. <laughs> i didn't read it as a sophia myth so much because in my understanding of the sophia myth is that she is the one doing the creating even mm. though it goes haywire um in this story it really seemed like he was the one doing the creating even though she was the one doing the maintaining but the part that it that read a little bit gnostic to me was almost like it's like a Christian person thought about God being bad for the first time, as opposed to strictly Gnostic, which which I think is a fantastic exploration. It's what got me on the path of Gnosticism, actually, of what if God isn't good? And so then um, what I had been reflecting on for the last few days after I watched the movie was we're taught in our culture and in many cultures that God is inherently good. And so when you get that still small voice of being inherent goodness, this movie kind of flipped that on the head. But what if, what if God wasn't good? What if God was actually very, very selfish? And she was trying to contort herself to try to meet what he wanted from her. But what he wanted from her was annihilation. And so, so how is that uh, goodness? for her perspective. It was good for him, but was it good for her? And and I think that's a worthwhile ex thing to explore in our own personal lives. Is this thing that maybe, quote, God, or that still small voice asked me to do, is it actually good for me? Or is it good for something else that I can't quite identify? I think that's worth wrestling with in ourselves. Yeah, yeah, and and I'd say too. Actually, I did misquote Clark because because I think he said the Shekinah. So it's I, I right. Think it's, so that would be different. Than yeah, Sophia. yeah. So you know, I wouldn't say straight Gnostic if you're going to go like Nag Hammadi Gnostic, but Gnostic key <laughs> definitely uh, Kabbalistic, because uh, you know in Kabbalah there's there's two creations. Uh, in in the first creation, the uh, the divine outpouring is too much for for the vessels for for the for the material that that is supposed to receive and become creation it can't handle the divine energy so it shatters it and the divine energy get caught up in the sh in the shards uh and descend because they're broken and, and become materiality uh and then in the second creation those those materials are used to to make this world right to, to, and try to fix things but you're you're still using those those broken materials from the first creation and of course in this movie at the beginning uh, we find out that the house had burnt down and this house was constructed from the previous house <laughs> and that uh there's there is even uh, she's asked by one of these intruders why didn't you just uh, start from uh start from scratch why did you just tear this down so so you know that to me seems like it's a very obvious sort of uh, Kabbalistic parallel, but but I think uh, Deacon Angie for for some of the, the Sophianic stuff, there's this this idea of the, the same thing as the Shekinah. The, the Shekinah is the descendant 
uh, divine feminine, right? The one that's here on this earth. So all the creation stuff um, uh, happened before Jennifer Lawrence kind of got there, right? So she's she's the the the, the Sophia Akimov, the one who's in this world, um, and that's why also why she's partly she she's still the wisest person, but she's also a little bit confused about what's going on, right? You know, and, and she is wise because she's always telling because you know she's always like she's right when she's telling the telling the, the poet uh why why are you letting these people in here why are you letting them destroy them and, and throughout the movie she's always telling the, these people to to stop doing things that hurts both them and the environment around them right so she is the voice voice of wisdom uh oh, sorry what were you going to say jason well i was going to actually like push back a bit on 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 yeah. the idea of her being sophia because i think like the you know the so going going back to i mean like uh, I'm the first one to say the author is dead when it comes to intention, but yeah. um, uh, but I like I think it's pretty documented that Aronofsky had the idea of her being Mother Nature, so yeah. like the the Gaia kind of principle. Like at one point, at one point um, he says like my goddess when when she comes mm -hmm. into the room, um, and the so I wonder if we if we're looking for Sophia if it's actually in the character of the poet in the character of him, where in that in that sense that he is kind of both manifesting something but in the in that manifesting is also creating a mistake if that makes sense like having that like uh like that i've got this amazing idea but then the idea leads to to zealotry and cannibalism and and like mass executions etc and it also feels important to to touch into that the creation being a good idea is is for his own selfishness yeah. where in her character it's more for what she can give to both of them mm -hmm. um which yeah i don't know how that relates to the gnosticism so much but just sort of noticing that his creation is for his own desires as opposed to a collective agreement yeah like the uh the, the central message of Gnosticism is, is maybe God isn't that great of a guy because we dance around it, but the Demiurge, I mean, the Demiurge in uh, the Valentinian thought is, is straight up divine, right? But even the Cephian Demiurge is an aspect of God, right? It, it, it may have stolen that power, but it originally came from Sophia and uh, has all the names and uh, attributes of God and is the God of this world and does even though it might be an accident, comes from the aeonic structure, right? So uh, I think uh, kind of uh, investigating this is an inherently kind of a, a Gnostic idea, right? Uh, particularly when you're flipping mythology around and moving it into different places to kind of kind of explore some of these ideas. Um, and of course, there, there are other interpretations, like you were saying, Jason. You know, and, and I think, again, it's the, the Mother Nature stuff is fairly obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, not the most, it's not the most subtle of metaphors. You know, the, these the humans keep coming into this despoiled paradise and ruining it <laughs> um uh, uh so so definitely this movie works on on a couple of uh on a couple of different levels um you know so uh, so oh, okay. sorry no go ahead go ahead john yeah. Yeah, so, so I did want to ask, like, do, do you consider it a horror movie? Does it does it work as a horror movie? If you didn't know anything about the Bible or or Gnosticism, would it would it still work as sort of a, a scary, creepy uh, horror movie? No, <laughs> I have a low tolerance for scary, and um, my spouse and I were talking about this this morning because we watched it together, and and his take was it wasn't so scary in the moment but i keep getting flashbacks that upset me so like i have remained wow. disturbed for a period of time after watching the movie so does that make it count as a a horror type experience mm -hmm. I, I think it mm. does kind of linger and, and that might be a good point yeah like all the best horror movies do uh yeah jason do you want to do you want to elaborate on, on your note <laughs> well, you know, actually, I think I think Angie might have uh, might have even turned me around there. I think like it doesn't work as a horror movie in the sense that if you're going in for a horror movie, expecting a horror movie experience, that you're going to get that. Because I think it's definitely once once the like the third act of the movie really begins and things go really crazy, it starts to become unreal enough that you're no longer scared in the moment. If that makes sense, you're no longer thinking okay, how is she going to get out of this? Because you're like, okay, I'm clearly in a metaphorical space, so I'm not really worried about the characters as people, you know? I'm no, I'm no longer identifying with them as individuals. Um, uh, but I think you, uh, but I think that, that said, the, uh, Angie's point about the, um, the scenes that stay with you um, do make it work as horror in the form of, of the thing that disturbs you, the thing that... The thing that um, unsettles you that leaves you kind of continually 
unsure about uh, about how to process that information. So in that respect, I think it does work as a horror movie. Um, it just doesn't feel like one in the moment. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can totally see that. And uh, I actually did appreciate because I, I was wondering, oh, should I watch this with my, my pregnant wife? And she has a very low <laughs> tolerance for horror movies. She can't really watch them. And, and, and even though this isn't the scariest movie made, I don't think this would be an appropriate one. I don't think she would have liked it. Not when she's in that much. headspace. <laughs> no. But I did actually appreciate, like Jason was saying, when the most extreme violence does happen in, in the last third, when, when things just become so big and over the top that it's, it's almost comical, right? So th that's where the, the more extreme or disturbing violence is but and not say that it isn't still disturbing right but at the same time like you know i almost laughed when they're 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 eating the baby by the way just to have the metaphor com completely obvious you know the, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're eating its its uh its, its body and it's and uh, drinking its blood like you know and it, it's not that i didn't find it that horrifying because it's 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 comical um do, do you folks could, think that could that, I oh, actually touch base on, on that point? Please. I thought that was actually an excellent critique of two different schools of thought of the Eucharist. So I am a huge Bernadette Roberts fan. I'm about to get on a soapbox about her again, which I think she has featured every time I've gotten on one of your talk calls, Deacon John. So no apologies. Anyway, so, um, you know, she really talks about how if we look at the Eucharist or communion as this literal eating of the body and the blood like they did in the movie. It's disgusting and it's horrifying. Um, and and I think the movie does a really good job of, of parsing this out because Bernadette says, what does our sin have to do with God? In the sense that there was nothing that anybody did in that movie, as horrifying as it was, that had any impact on God. Like he was just gonna do whatever he was gonna do in, in the setting, and just like in this world, whether we sin, whether we're good, the the tide of, of fate <laughs> rolls out in, in whatever way. But she talks about how in the Eucharist, we're, we're not joining to a body and blood, we're joining to something bigger, the Christ, which is separate from body, which is separate from from physical manifestation, it's a thing that we are called to embody. And so if we look at the Eucharist as just the body and blood and the cons like consuming that, then it is horrific. If we take a step out of that and keep it actually in metaphor as something that we embody, then the movie doesn't touch on that at all. But I, I felt like it really solidified in myself, deepening in that longing to be part of the oneness as opposed to doing this weird ritual. So that's my soapbox on that. Well, and, and I think even to, to, to go further with that, it's like you can see, um, like the, the, because not like people are, are, are consuming this baby, but they are, they are consuming it out of worship. Like you mm -hmm. know, they're not, they're not doing it in a hungry way. They're not just cannibals They're Um, so it's, what's interesting there too, is that like, there's the, the critique isn't so much uh, like the, the critique is in their their mistake in um in their zealotry like they, they just want to be close to this inspiration so much that they're just they're pulling things off of the wall and they're like they're they're going crazy over this baby but it's it's coming from that inspiration place not from a just a like a feral animalistic attack mode does that make sense as a it does and and it's almost like we're you know in that sort of more internal aspect of spirituality called to connect with the creator as opposed to take from the creator so nobody sat exactly. down to learn from him they just wanted to take from well both of them and and i think just paying attention or exploring that in in our own lives could be interesting that's 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 a Damn, that's a good bomb there. That's a, like a thought bomb. That yeah, uh, ta uh, not taking. Uh, how did you say that again? Not instead of taking, what was the alternative? Connecting or learning from, as opposed mm. to taking. Yeah, well, there's the, that's a whole thing about like not just. I mean, the, the collector mentality, or the the accumulation mentality is. Or the so um, what is that called? The prosperity evangelism. You know. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, prosperity gospel. That's that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. That there, like the uh, uh, that that human 
uh, desire to like hold a thing as a way of uh, like as a feeling of ownership like because i am holding it i own it you know um there's a whole thing in sto stoic thought about um that the only thing you can control literally is your own reason you can't control even your own body you could but you can control your reason and so and and the world is full of change so everything in your life is essentially on loan to you and can be taken at any time and and that uh so rather than hang on to something tightly and then feel badly when it gets taken from you hold everything lightly you know um i mean there's a whole other philosophical direction that that can that can be a problem with as well but that really i'm just really connecting to your point there um and like learning from what you're holding versus feeling like you need to take it and keep it uh -huh. yeah, yeah mm, and thank you yeah no i i completely agree and that's it's really powerful thank you angie and, and i think too coming back to some central things that we like to talk about on the show jason um which is uh like in this movie like uh, artists are self-centered right so you can make a a, a parable a parable movie about the earth you can make a parable movie about uh religion and kabbalah and gnosticism but of course because you're a narcissist you're also going to have to talk about the artistic struggle right <laughs> and also talk about what you went through making this movie so i think that's in there too but i think that's a central gnostic or we could even say platonic point right is that something is perfect when when it's an idea when you try to incarnate it and make it reality problems just naturally arise <laughs> um and, and i think we see a bit of this in the movie right the 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 artist kind of says something like that i think and also about how the way the ways in which his work is inspiring people right the, the, these beautiful poems and then of course we see all this this chaos uh the these fights these battles like there's basically a little war inside of the house if you haven't seen the movie uh mm -hmm. there's basically like a, almost like a holocaust scene inside of the movie uh, in, sorry inside of the house so uh, uh and, and these these are the uh, the uh, performed by these intruders who are inspired by his work. So I, I think that is both a, a central artistic point that this beautiful, perfect, wonderful work that is in your head, once you get it out into the material world, it's never as good, right? It doesn't matter if you're a writer or a sculptor or a painter. And uh, I think that's also a sort of a, a platonic point talking about the, the forms and the pleroma and what happens when we, when we get incarnated. It's not necessarily that things go badly or tend towards evil or get that corrupt or bad. It, they're just never they're just never as good as they are in your head uh things just get, always get a little wonky well and there's a like the never as good as uh they're in your head and like things like um once you try to create problems arise those those words i think are interesting because from the from the perspective of the poet like he's never that bothered uh i mean in the movie or in the in the credits he's just listed as him <laughs> um yeah. so i mean again kind of on the nose but uh um he's never that upset about a lot of the things that are happening unless they are like um you know he's upset with the mother as she's upset about something um you know he is still trying to protect her help her etc but he's never that upset about the fact that the fans are there you know he wants to share the baby with them like he wants them to experience a lot of this stuff so there's a sense in which like um one of the things that I've I've been really thinking a lot about is that our the way we we talk about or think about good bad good evil as it relates to Gnosticism and how we like look at at a at the divine like I start to wonder if without trying to go into an amoral direction if like if this is also trying to really question or engage with like what what um, the divine isn't necessarily good but it might be total if that makes sense yeah. um like because the, the other thing is that this is a cycle like this we see what we what we see at the beginning which feels like an impressionistic experience of this crystal being placed on a mantelpiece and then the house kind of manifesting uh you find out later is actually it's just part of a cycle and um and it'll probably just keep going and that that just keep going this makes me makes me wonder too if there's a sense of which like kind of like I was saying like this is going to happen it's not a matter of if it should have happened or if there was a different way a better way it could have happened that's kind of those are our questions that aren't really applicable the, the it's simply that it will happen life and death will happen and 
and that it's not about like that, that um, if her goals were satisfied, then nothing would happen. You know what I mean? They would just be in the house forever. Um, no movie would happen. And so there's kind of that sense of which like, uh, I kind of alluded to this earlier that like we, that, uh, that that good like the, the the term of whether or not he is good or selfish or or whether or not his idea got corrupted is actually kind of beside the point because at least the the way we see the the his experience through it he doesn't seem bothered by it so it doesn't seem like that is a uh, uh, an applicable way for him to judge that experience to to a point I think for me watching the movie and experiencing the the best part of it was actually the way the actor used his face as a tool of coercion. Mm. Mm. Um, and how when she, the only time he really experienced um, or expressed his pleasure was when she didn't want to go along with the plan. Mm. And like, even she, you know, gives birth to the baby and she knows that he wants to show it to the crowds and she holds it until she falls asleep and then he takes it from her mm -hmm. and the way just with his expression that he uses coercion to get her to do what he wants to continue or to to what's the word i'm looking for to the word that comes to mind is like exaltation like he wanted their adoration and he would give them everything but he had to take it from her. Mm. Um, I thought that was really interesting. And the subtlety of it, I felt like they captured that on film really, really well. Better than I think I've noticed in other, you know, film or yeah, TV yeah. shows. I think, I think that, that's, that's spot on, particularly the, yeah, that, that um, the, the unarticulated coercion, like mm -hmm. uh, instead of saying, no, you are going to do this, um, or like, or even because one of the things that I thought was interesting in that wanting to take the baby thing is that um, uh, he he asks for the baby a few times and she says no, and then he just pushes this chair closer to her and sits there and stares at her. Um, he asks, I think, again later and says no, but like, there's a version of the movie, or there's a, like, if this were not a more like allegorical movie and, and there was less of a like, I was I was prepared for male violence there, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, I was prepared for him to like hit her and just take the baby from her or, you know, in some way, in some case, overpower her to just take the baby. And he didn't. And I think that's an, also an interesting choice because it, it's just that guilt tripping, <laughs> you know. But he did overpower her because she was so exhausted true. from yeah, giving true. birth. I, yeah. I can just say from experience, <laughs> it's very tiring <laughs> to give birth. <laughs> <laughs> you're real sleepy after that happens um, <laughs> but my point is is that is a form of violence um True. by waiting for someone to get to exhaustion after such a th and you know and like her birth experience was full of violence and it would have been exhausting itself so mm -hmm. um i think it was a really good representation actually of how women often experience violence yeah. yes because yeah. it's not necessary it's the violence you like if you look at domestic violence or even coercive control outside of a domestic partnership, the coercion and the control does not happen through these big outbursts. It happens through those looks of face. It happens through those mm -hmm. subtle moments of I'm going to wait you out. I'm going to, I'm going to hold you till you're your most vulnerable and mm -hmm. then take from you. And I think that that movie did an excellent job of capturing that experience. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, uh, the the one thing so like I agree with that completely. The one thing that I'm still not convinced on is that he's only doing it for adoration, like that he takes the baby to the to the crowd, because there's something almost like innocent in his ex experience of these people that are coming to him. Like mm. uh, he is so like he's like wow they really like this you know right. Um, and then like, well, they came all this way. I should, I should give them something because they came all this way. I should, you know, I should celebrate with them. I should be a part of this. Th that's, that I think is, again, there's something interesting to me there, like that, 
I think like I could see a version of this movie where he does just take the baby from her, and I could also see a version of this movie where he is fully sort of corrupted by fame. You know, he's like sleeping with other women, he's doing drugs, etc. You know, and that it's interesting to me that their the, the handle they had on the metaphor was tight enough to keep to keep from what would have been in a in a, like I can see somebody giving notes on this script, going like, "Why isn't he, you know, partying more? Why isn't he, you know what I mean? Like, like how could he possibly forgive them? Like, <laughs> you know." Um, uh, so I think um, I just think that's a really interesting choice, and I think your your point about both of those actors, I think Javier Bardem and Jennifer Lawrence, do a, like the amount of work they're doing just with their faces. I found it to be an extremely well-acted movie, and uh, Kristen Wiig, who's n normally a comedic actress, is, is excellent yeah. in it. I actually wish she had an even larger role, and I hope she plays... Uh, I mean, she has done dramas, but I hope she's in more creepy, thriller, pseudo-horror horror movies and actual horror movies in the future. So. <laughs> yeah, her almost bubbliness um, that she brought to that scene made it creepier somehow. Like, yeah. she wasn't super over the top, but like just enough of a smile to be like, that's not right. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what the genre this is really in, uh, Jason, is, is one that, that's probably familiar to you, which is like the the sort of absurdist existential existentialist modernist plays of the of the uh, early to mid twentieth century, right? Mm -hmm. From the uh, the the twenties to to the sixties. So, I, and that's not the, my observation. I, I think critics of this movie, this movie was uh, very controversial and divisive, by the way. Uh, really, uh, the, the those that didn't like it, you know, called it a, a Pinter ripoff. Uh, so, and uh, I'm trying to remember the name of a. Uh, the, the Pinter play where there's the, the man standing in the garden, but there is this kind of genre of like strangers uh, who are obviously allegorical figures and are unnamed or have a name like doctor or man, you know, bursting into a home and doing all these weird things with like people who are more normal or acting, trying to be more normal or have a more normal uh, experience environment. And then at the end you find out, oh, they were in purgatory or, oh, it's all a metaphor for the Holocaust or what have you. <laughs> so they, this does kind of fit into that that genre that that's i don't know what that, that's a really long genre all those words i just said but. <laughs> <laughs> well like, uh, yeah just a uh a, a, a an overtly metaphorical story um, yeah yeah uh versus a, a more subtle you know or if not subtle at the very least uh, perhaps less focused on metaphor um well that, that actually uh, that leads me the, the well to my my next question for for you both which is did did looking did, did did me telling you that it, that it's a gnostic allegory even if it isn't or that might be a reading or that I've heard that it is did, did, you knew you knew going into it that at least it was an allegory did that ruin your 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 enjoyment of it as as a narrative as a movie like like for me it, it does a little bit right particularly when it, when I know that it is a powerfully an allegorical movie sometimes I like to be surprised by a little bit of gnosticism or some unattended unattended gnosticism so the, how about for you folks does, does it take away at the narrative level at all for you i think like sorry and maybe i'll I've, I've been talking a lot angie maybe i'll let you take this one first i've been talking a lot too um it did not for me um i kind of i mean when i watch a movie i don't i don't mind a little bit of the insider scoop because then i can just relax and, and go for the ride and see how they're going to tell the story this time um because while it was allegorical it wasn't you know it wasn't trying to be scriptural, for lack of a better phrase. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So yeah, no, it, that didn't ruin it for me. I, I was curious to see how they were going to twist and turn the same story. Hmm. Uh, so I think um, I tr I didn't try to like learn a lot about the movie until I watched it. I did watch the trailer. Um, so I think uh, uh, for me, like. I mean, like uh, part of the whole point of, of the, the sort of pop gnosis idea is that we are like intentionally trying to find Gnostic connections with things, at, even and especially if it's unintentional. So I'm always, I'm kind of always just doing that. Mm -hmm. But um, the movie that I, that the trailer promised me, and then this movie were so different <laughs> that um, like I thought this was going to be a movie of essentially kind of a Rosemary's Baby kind of thing. Like there's going to be a cult and Maybe he's part of it, maybe he's not, but then the cult is going to be all around them and she gets sacrificed or something. I was like, that's kind of, I was like, I feel like I kind of, I can guess what this movie's going to be. The trailer kind of promises this. And then like, I think it's like when the brother 
when the brothers, uh, one brother kills the other one in the end, uh, the, 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 the murderer gets a mark on his head. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I think that's I don't about when, when, when Chris I don't get it. What? Was, why? Uh, oh no! <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I had a good time, but he, you know, he did not yeah. as much. <laughs> I, I still really enjoyed it, but I think going back to your point about knowing um, it's a uh, an allegory, uh, distract from it on a narrative level. I think that's kind of a um, that's not a. a that's an interesting question generally. With this movie, you can't not see the allegory at a certain point. Like the allegory begins to take over. So um, I think like, uh, kind of like I was saying earlier about it not being a horror movie is that um, the because it was wearing the allegory on its sleeve, it made it, it, made it sort of less narratively um, uh, distracting. Like w w one thing that uh, a lot of writers talk about is that fiction is a a reality simulator. We like we we consume stories because that's a way for us to to do what if scenarios with things that aren't happening. Um, so we can kind of think about how we would react or how we feel about those reactions. It's kind of uh, imagination is actually kind of one of those things that uh, that might be kind of the secret sauce about about like human consciousness that it, our ability to not just um, not, not just like reason things, but to think things that don't exist um, is kind of a, like a whole big thing. Um, but when when the fiction is sort of really clearly saying this isn't real, then our ability, like our reality simulator kind of goes like, okay, this isn't real. So now I'm just kind of paying attention to its to its allegories, to, to its connections. And I think that's that's a thing that may, means that um, how do I put this? Like, I think so. When we're listening to myth, when we're listening to um, to to like re religious narratives that are being presented to us as religious narratives, so that we know that there's a meaning we're supposed to take from it that comes from a particular place, um, uh, it that can be useful, but it often doesn't sneak through your your um, your brain quite the same way that that fiction does. And I think um, to Angie's point about how, like, in the moment, it doesn't necessarily um, work as a as a true like um, as an experience that you're believing is happening to these characters because it becomes so allegorical. Its mythic resonance means that it does stick with you. So it's kind of like I think it. I enjoyed it, but I didn't enjoy it the same way I, way I would enjoy like a Martin McDonough play where the banter feels almost lifelike, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was thinking similar things uh, that I've already stated while watching it. Uh, it's, it's an interesting piece to compare and contrast to say The Shining because the movie is still shot like a horror movie and there's definitely tension, especially in the first half, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they're just ratcheting up the tension. And I, I think uh, and I think he must have been thinking about The Shining or, or you know, definitely the author. It's hard not to think of you know, an isolated uh, place uh, <laughs> with, with, uh, with a writer and... Uh, uh, and a wife and these marital problems and yada 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 um where sometimes i you know I, i'm a big fan of the shining but i think it's clearly a, a metaphor for uh an allegory for for child abuse uh but he doesn't break kayfabe in that movie right so you it, it does he kesson break of, what sorry uh it, it, it uh, a metaphor an allegory for child abuse um uh but you said k Oh, sorry, sorry, kayfabe. Uh, that, 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 that's sorry, Angie. Uh, I, I should use words that are normal uh, because that is that is a term from wrestling. When... Oh, jeez, no, was not, I was not going to get there. No, for a, you're like the next what, what ancient years. Greek? What ancient Greek phrase is that? Is that is that from the Nagamati? <laughs> No yes, yeah, so, so kayfabe is the is the illusion that the professional wrestling is real, right? So like oh, what you'd watch on, on WWE, and then if you if you break kayfabe, you're you're letting people in uh, uh, in that 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 it's, that it's all all an act. So, anyways, uh, did you uh, uh, staying on? But I'm, I'm mentioning all this to bring it back to genre because this is, we are putting this out as a Halloween special. So to talk about like horror in general, do you think that that horror is a good genre for exploring Gnosticism or not? Or what, what are some of your, your thoughts on that? Uh, I think like so. Part of what makes horror. Um, 
horror work is that it's the uh it's it's usually the idea that like it's the unknown cracking through it's it's something coming that you didn't expect that you can't necessarily deal with um and so it's like uh i think like i think there is like i honestly i think you could probably do a gnostic interpretation of just about any horror movie as soon as you start to approach it from that perspective because um, because that's kind of what we're dealing with. That's the whole sort of an anamnesis bag is like um, discovering something that you didn't know you'd forgotten, you know, um, uh, and and for, in ways that don't make sense. Like, you know, the, the the you've locked the house, but then like you wake up in the middle of the night and the door is open. How did that happen? You know. Um, uh, there's something in the basement, even though there couldn't there couldn't be anything in the basement. Mm -hmm. That like that inability, uh, or like that 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 thing cracking through the reality you thought you built up around yourself, is I think like that's kind of the a core piece of horror, and um, it's a core piece of, of Gnosticism. So yeah, I think that's kind of a that's sort of built in. Okay, cool. Angie, any reflections on, on horror and Gnosticism? Uh, no, I mean, so when you were first messaging me about this, I, I, I was like, well, how scary is the movie? And like, what kind of, is this like, <laughs> because I, I kind of put movies in like, is this going to be a torture fest? Because if it is, I'm out. I mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to participate. If it's going to make me think a little bit, psychologically freak me out. I'm a hundred percent here for that. So, um, I hadn't really spent much time in the horror genre um, because I'm I'm a big scaredy cat, so <laughs> yeah, I had to there's prep myself a... before watching the movie. You know, like just when you say that the torture stuff, like there's a there's kind of because there's a whole genre of of horror that's specifically around that, and um, you know, it. Uh, I wonder too if there's like on one hand, like I'm talking about this idea of things cracking through. And those things, in, in the case of horror, those things that crack through aren't necessarily good. <laughs> um, and I've I also kind of tracked there earlier the idea that maybe good and bad aren't necessarily the most in, most useful ways to talk about Gnosticism. But um, but what I'm also kind of wondering here too is because there's a there's a um, a brand or a, like a style of Gnosticism that is essentially just focused on how bad the world is, mm -hmm. um, without ever really kind of going now what. Or like, how do you then experience gnosis? You know, and there's a kind of that that genre of horror might be a reflection of that style of gnosticism, which is to say, all we're going to focus in is on the, the demiurge and the archons and how bad the world is, and it's just bad, 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 uh, and we're going to revel in how bad it is, or at the very least, obsess in how bad it is, and we're going to zoom in on the horror, and we're going to. And we're going to assume the absolute worst because demiurge, archons, bad, 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 kind of thing. Um, uh, I just had that idea as you were talking about torture, torture movies, and I'm like, yeah, what is, what would that be from a Gnostic perspective? Yeah, well, like I was saying, it was uh, a, a divisive movie. Um, I mean, most many movies are nowadays, but this one in particular, it, uh, it, it got very good critical acclaim, and Aronofsky often gets very, very high critical acclaim, but it was also nominated for, for three Golden Raspberries, which is the, the parody <laughs> awards of the of the Oscars, if you're familiar uh, with it. Uh, and the, the people who hated it and the critics who hated it really, really, really hated it. So what... Uh, what did you folks think of it? Like, did you like it? Did you dislike it? A mix? What did you like about it? What did you dislike about it? Lay it on me. Um, you know, I think I just ranted there for a long time. Angie, I'm going to let you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so I liked the acting, especially the the way that they captured the, the faces, as I already discussed. I thought that was just exquisitely done. Um, did I like the movie? I don't know if I super liked it, but I do think it's, as a Gnostic, I think it's fantastic to question the goodness of God. Um, I, I feel like by not questioning it, we can, I'll, I'll just speak from my own personal experience. When, when I was involved in communities that only talked about God as good, I felt very conflicted a lot of the time because 
just look outside and and then it's god good it's god bad why doesn't god stop evil we we do these roundy rounds with these sort of mental gymnastics and and then and then we just end up with have faith and i feel like gnosticism really liberates <laughs> liberated me from that that whole um twist and then and then it was for me personally actually easier to see the goodness in the disaster mm -hmm. so the dumpster is on fire the the world is chaotic and terrible and yet there is goodness in it and so my job on this planet this time around is to to try to find the specks of goodness where where i can find them knowing full well that often i won't be able to and that's actually okay and very um that it's okay and that that that's that helps me navigate this world now as far as the movie um i actually felt it leaned heavier on this is all trash than even my <laughs> own personal <laughs> philosophy <laughs> you know like like the movie was really bleak and there there wasn't a lot of goodness in it mm -hmm. um and you know, that I, I felt like giving permission to have that, because it was so allegorical, giving people permission to have those questions, I think is actually a really powerful exercise um, and important. So I think it served a really good purpose, um, even if it was a little heavier on the bleakness than, than my comfort level allowed for. Mm -hmm. I, I think like um, I can see why critics why so, why some critics and audience members would uh, would hate it because there is sometimes like so I don't mind allegory but for some for some folks uh, when a, when they can tell the movie is trying to sell you something like an idea or a point mm -hmm. they start to feel betrayed like I showed up for a story and you're giving me a lesson <laughs> that's not fair you know um, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Neil Gaiman actually was talking uh, or had a he wrote a comic about uh, what it was like to get into the fantasy writer Michael Moorcock. And in, at one point he was saying that uh, he was a fan of um, uh, C.S. Lewis and the, the Narnia series, right up until the point that he started to go, wait a second, <laughs> this is a little close to home. Um, uh, and. And then he then so then he then switched over to Michael Moorcock, who's writing sort of more pulpy fantasy. Um, and then he, he was saying like, oh, and all of these things that like kind of clearly have sexual metaphors, that doesn't mean anything, no, sir. <laughs> um, uh, I feel safe over here, but that's uh, I, I think to his point is that there is the there is a um, sometimes like when when a when a story is being overtly intentionally allegoric. It, it can become hard to like it the same way we like a lot of other stories because it's now no longer playing by the same rules. Um, uh, like, I, I remember when I was a kid, I would uh, I be, would be watching, like, say, Kevin Smith movies, which were full of this kind of banter. Also, like, uh, unacknowledged homophobia, but that's a whole other story. Um, but, like, and I would play that banter over in my head because it, fe it felt so real, and so I was enjoying being lost in the realness of these of this story um uh and this is this is a kind of movie that 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 um prevents you from having that experience and i think that's so i i liked the movie i think like again i think it's mythic resonances do sort of stick with you but i don't um but i, I like i sort of i'm having that sort of sort of same allergic reaction that neil gaiman talked about about going like wait a second you're trying to sell me something um, uh, I think Angie's point about like the idea of not presenting the idea of God or heck or even necessarily like, or just the whole thing as good and making you question how good works is I think really interesting. Um, uh, but I also wonder like what would a movie like this be like if if it didn't have that turn where all of a sudden we're like okay I know what this is you know. What would that be like to have an experience where, where, where you have that realization when you're going for drinks afterwards, or when you're having, when you're brushing your teeth afterwards, um, and then you kind of have a different, uh, like a you have a, a more investigative experience versus a like, this is a lesson. Do I agree or not? Experience. Um, 
Uh, but like one of the things that like, so I, when I was watching the movie and especially once I started to kind of see the direction it was going, I like, and my whole point there about the, the poet being sort of innocent uh, in his experience of the, the, the love that he was getting from everybody um, is that uh, like, I think something I actually got from a Talknosis episode, I made a note and I don't know where it came from while I was listening. Um, it wasn't one that I was on was that something about that the world is actually how we filter the divine light so we can so we can experience it um so that it's not so much that the world is a thing keeping us from it it's like sort of the world is a thing that allows us to in our temporal bodies to experience the world do you know what i mean like we we don't have a way to approach divinity that isn't that doesn't just blast us apart you know um uh and that like I, that uh the 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 uh, the, the creative force isn't necessarily good, but is total, if that makes sense. Like it's telling the whole thing. Um, those were things that I think I really kind of grappled with. And I, I enjoyed the fact that the movie made me grapple with those. Yeah. Well, we're coming up to, to the hour mark. Uh, Jason, do you, do you have final questions or points? Um, yeah, like I think I would love to hear what other people had to say about this, like if they felt uh, that the allegory was too much or not enough, or um, uh, I think like uh, uh, Angie's point about the, or, or the point I had leaped off of from Angie about the, um, about horror, torture horror movies as, uh, as sort of a uh, demiurge archon obsessed genre is I think something else that I'd, I'd love to, I think, talk more about. So maybe let us know if you, if you're interested in that. Um, yeah, I think that's about it for me. Dick and John, did you like the movie? I did, oh. yeah. I, oh, sorry. No, yeah, I, I, I did, but I, I think we're we're very much on the same page about about a lot of aspects of it, and I think it would be a, a better piece. I think it would be a tighter work, uh, if uh, particularly that last third, if, if they if he had throttled back a little bit less on on the metaphor, right, on the <laughs> allegory. Uh, but overall, I, I liked it quite a bit. Yeah, and it, 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 just like you're saying, Angie. Oh, okay. There's things I can think about. I like, you know, I'm the kind of guy who likes to figure out things, so I, I appreciate that. But uh, besides the sort of intellectual allegory aspects it's it's well shot Aronofsky's mm -hmm. a fantastic director there, there's lots of uh, uh, great camera work uh, and there's uh, a, a lot of uh, great performances the, uh, the, the, the I mean the whole cast is you know there's Ed Harris there's Michelle Pfeiffer it's, it's just a fantastic cast all around so uh, um, and hopefully Kristen Wiig will I'm sure she's watching and listening will we'll, we'll do, we'll, <laughs> we'll do more more creepy movies Kristen um, if you want to be on the show drop us a line yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> So uh, yeah, so this this is the the test for popnosis, but but watch for more popnosis in the future, right, Jason? So yeah, yeah, we're yeah. coming soon. And uh, oh yeah, any any closing plugs? I've got mylandmeditation.substack.com, open secular meditation, eleven a.m. Sunday morning, uh, Montreal time. That's Eastern Standard Time. I, I teach uh, meditation, secular meditation, the psychological uh, tradition for stress relief. So this is uh, this is good if you're religious. It's good if you're not religious. Um, people say when they listen to the podcast that I uh, slur and ramble my words together. So that's mile end, as in the end of the mile. Mileendmeditation.substack.com. And that uh, you two have any plugs? I do not. Okay. SageTheater.com. Yeah. That's yeah, Sage. <laughs> that's the theater company I work for, Sage Theater. Um, and uh, actually, honestly, the only other plug I would say right now is uh, keep your eye on this space for on Talknosis for some more Popnosis ideas. Amazing, amazing. And yeah, just like Jason was saying too. I mean, uh, send some in, right, Jason? Like. Uh, exactly. Uh, maybe we will actually get you that that long uh, awaited email address, but you can also send them in to us uh, just like in the comments below on our social media pages. There's lots of ways if you're consuming this and there's a way to contact us. So uh, please do uh, uh, send in your, your ideas and your suggestions for, for pieces for, for Jason to uh, to tackle. Okay, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Uh, happy Halloween, by the way. Uh, and uh, uh, take care. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.